I really love Max's deadpan style. Well, just for you, Pickles, here's more where that came from. See? Deadpan! <laughs> no, we're not running out of ideas at all, I promise you. Dinner's ready. Hello? Anyone home? Oh, right. Come have a look at this, darling. Ugh. What is it? Oh god, what have you done now, you cretin? We'll have to clear that up, you know. Red just doesn't go the blue on that duvet, now does it? Well, look at that. Seems like only yesterday he was struggling to walk and learning how to speak. Now look at him, he can ride a bike, he's got himself a job in a pub, and he's even worked out how to commit suicide. Our son is all grown up, I'm really proud of him. Oh. Hey, look here. There's a note. Oh, he's left a note as well. How thoughtful of him. Uh, um, so this must be how the gun works, smiley face. In all seriousness, I have decided to leave the world because I am tired. Tired, above all, of trying pointlessly to make sense of trial of a Time Lord. Sorry, love you always, bye. Oh well, didn't make any sense to me, but, you know... His decision and all. Oh, it's a shame, you know. He really would have liked tonight's dinner. I was cooking his favourite and everything. I really was, you know. And da 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 The trial of a Time Lord is dangerous. Everyone who has sat down to watch Trial of a Time Lord with the intent of critical analysis is now dead. Absolutely everyone, without exception, killed themselves soon after watching it in a desperate attempt to unsee this monstrosity. So drastic were people's responses that this ended up being referenced in later episodes of the show itself. Stephen Moffat was inspired to write the underrated episode Extremis upon hearing that cases like these had happened but had been buried as part of a mammoth BBC cover-up. The Trial of the Time Lord is of course represented in this story by the Veritas book, which also carries a worryingly positive correlation between people who've read it and mass suicide pacts. Ironically, the story takes place in series 10, a series with weird parallels to season 23 31 years earlier. Both came after a long hiatus, both saw a large drop in viewing figures, and both were the last hurrahs for various writers and actors that were playing the Doctor. In the case of extremists, these were not coincidences. They were deliberate attempts on the part of Moffat to evoke the sense of calling back to the trial of a Time Lord. Magnus Magnusson, was he born in Iceland or Scotland? Iceland. Peter At the time, the late magician and TV personality Paul Daniels was driven insane by the story, as can be seen in this disturbing footage from Every Second Counts, the game show he was hosting at the time. And now, a little surprise. <laughs> <laughs> if Karen and Wilma do not get an answer right, <laughs> I throw one of these tomahawks... We're probably relying on that test card a bit too much, aren't we? But never mind. Boing. Boom. Chuck. Boing. Boom. Chuck. Boing. Boom. Chuck. While in Dusseldorf, Germany, the hugely influential synth-pop group Kraftwerk were at the top of their game in the early 80s, having revolutionised the sound of pop music using synthesizers time and again throughout the prior 10 years, albums such as The Man Machine and Computer World remain a classic. However, they were so taken aback by the 1986 series of Doctor Who, it threw them off completely. Founding member Ralph Hutter fell off his bicycle, and the band lost enough momentum for their subsequent album, Electric Cafe, later also known as Techno Pop, to become a critical and commercial flop that was forever seen as a come down from their earlier, better known works. Two of the band's four members, Carl Bartos and Wolfgang Fleur, disappeared from the band shortly after, and have never been seen again since, leading to speculation that they took their own lives after watching Trial of a Time Lord. The fact that Kraftwerk has seldom reared its head with new material since, suggests that the story also had a significant long-term impact on the members of the band who survived. Since 1986, the band has only released two studio albums and two live compilations. 
Of course, all of this was nothing to do with the quality of season 23. All right, well, it was partly a response to poor quality. The young woman, Miss Perpigillian Brown, is alive and well and living as a warrior queen with King Yakarnos. Ah, fetch me my pistol, matron! But the main reason Trial elicited such terrifying and disturbing responses was that it was drizzled in a cheese and onion flavoured perception filter by the then controller of BBC One, Michael Grade, who was furious that the show had already survived his cancellation and wanted a good excuse to finally get rid of a show that he hated, preferably before he was outed by David Icke as the lizard that he secretly was along with the royal family. To this end, he was quite prepared to kill dozens, nay, millions of viewers, just to achieve his selfish aims. Abrupt gear change in video from jokey to serious. This does not in any way mean that season 23 is without its faults. The general aesthetic and production values of the show did work in Michael Gray's favour, because bar some individual moments and excellent incidental music from Dominic Glynn and other people, to my eye, this season has a rather shabby look. With the episode count reduced for this year, and the budget to my knowledge not lowered significantly from the season before, this is probably less down to the quality of the set, and more down to the fact that this was the first season to rely entirely on outside broadcast videotape. It results in a much more consistent look, and is quicker and more practical to work with than film is, but it looks much worse, especially as time goes on and screen resolutions increase because videotape is not naturally high definition and can't be remastered to look like it was shot yesterday in the same way that film can be. But more importantly, this magnum opus promised a story filled with ambition, complexity and scale that slowly unfolded over the course of 14 weeks. And although that was certainly the intention of script editor Eric Saywood, Due to production problems that we'll discuss later on, things did not turn out that way. What we ended up with was not one colossus of a story, but rather four, arguably five different stories mashed together with gaffer tape. The first story, and Doctor Who's comeback after an ultimately damaging 18 month hiatus, was Robert Holmes' The Mysterious Planet. It's a pleasant enough story on its own, I've talked about it before as being the rich man's orphan 55, but it is rather lightweight and doesn't really fit into the overarching trial arc very well. The problem is that the actual story has little to do with the arc, beyond some throwaway references to the Time Lords covering up something or other, an interesting concept that does result in a very intriguing scene when details start becoming censored. But it gets forgotten about until episode 13, by which point a 1980s audience unused to plot arcs would have forgotten about it. There's also very little in the story that explains why the Doctor is on trial. The story feels like a very random pick for the prosecution, unlike the following story. Eric Say with the script editor in charge, clearly assumed that just throwing in a few cutscenes every now and then when we cut back to the trial room would have been enough to remind the viewers that this was actually part of a wider story. But you can take the trial scenes out of this story and they wouldn't change anything. Parts 9 to 12 also suffer from this problem, but at least here the trial scenes were used sparingly, had good reasons for turning up, and did stop the action too abruptly. They're particularly jarring in the mysterious planet, because very little happens in them, and they turn up at the most inconvenient point when scenes haven't even finished naturally. I protest! I don't like this, you stupid idiot! Yes, but the reason this happened was this, this, and insert logical argument here. Oh, shut up, knacker's yard! But Doctor, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Oh. Right, um, sorry. My apologies. Carry on. We didn't actually learn anything or go anywhere during this scene, did we? No, we didn't. And, while the Doctor is known for being churlish in the face of Gallifreyan authority, to have the Doctor hurling abuse in every scene becomes tiring and unfunny very quickly. It's a far cry from the equal-sided debate we saw in the similar trial that took place towards the end of the War Games. There, the second Doctor did a good job of justifying why he'd become a proactive force for justice, and there are occasions here where he argues that he was trying to help and lives were at stake, but they happen too rarely compared to stupid running gags about boatyards. Things do pick up with Mind Warp, 
a story that is much better integrated into the trial, introducing some excellent ideas that the Matrix is lying, which plays very well into the rest of the season, particularly because it's the Doctor's sole chance of redemption. Towards the end, there's also some proper drama. The Doctor turns on his friends, and just as he's about to undo his mess and save Perry, he gets taken out of time at precisely the wrong moment, cruelly prevented from saving Perry from being experimented on. Plus, you get to see Syl again. Mind Warp rocks. I like Mind Warp. Terror of the Vervoids, on the other hand, is weird. It's the one that got away, with multiple writers dropping out or receiving the approval of the script editor, Eric Sayward, only for him to be overruled by the producer, John Nathan Turner. At the end of his tether, Sayward reluctantly got in the old-fashioned husband and wife writing team, Pip and Jane Baker. Their contribution has some great ideas. It's a competent whodunit murder mystery inspired by the abusive relationship between humanity and plant life, and horrific scientific experiments gone wrong. A nice call back to Mind Warp. There's just one aspect that lets the side down. The patronising, unnatural style of dialogue. Uh, hello, you ready to order, sir? Ah, you're the waiter! Yes, I know that. Uh, are you ready to order, sir? Indeed, I would find your combination of beef mince, tomatoes, oxo cubes and spaghetti certainly most agreeable, thank you. What, you mean the spag bowl, sir? Yes, the combination of beef mince, tomatoes, oxo cubes and spaghetti, please. Um, I prefer to just say spag bowl, sir, that's what it's called. Very well, and no starter for me, please. Um, yes, well, I inferred that from the fact you didn't mention a starter and only listed the main course. So. <laughs> well, yes, you, you probably did, but it's good to have clarity, isn't it? Be sure. Yes. Well, um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just get that for you, sir. I'll, I'll take your menu. Look, kids, the waiter is taking my menu. Now he's walking to the kitchen, you'll never guess, but when he re-emerges from hibernation, which isn't actually what he's doing, but we'll call it that because it sounds grown up and pretentious, he's going to be carrying my dinner on a useful contraption called a plate! Isn't that remarkable? <laughs> SHUT UP! So yes, uh, then there's the ultimate foe. Uh, the most crucial story, as it has the responsibility of tying up all the loose ends of a 14 week long story. So of course this had to be where problems with the scripts really kicked off. Basically, Robert Holmes and Eric Sayward, by this point close friends, were originally intending to write the two part conclusion together. Unfortunately, Robert Holmes died of hepatitis, having only just gotten halfway through the scripts. Saywood, who'd already decided to leave the role of script editor once the series had finished, was distraught, and determined to finish episode 14 the way Holmes had intended. This included a mighty duel between the Doctor and the Valiard, culminating in a cliffhanger ending in which the Doctor is left trapped in the Matrix, with his future left uncertain. The only problem was that John Nathan Turner, the producer, was equally determined for the story to have an ending that closed the story completely, with the judgement of the trial being properly delivered. He later said this was influenced by the last time the show had had such an ambitious arc, the 1978 Key to Time season, which, in his view, ended in a rather anticlimactic way. Mainly, he was concerned that Sayward's proposed ending would give the BBC the justification they needed to cancel the show once and for all, even though, as Sayward pointed out in a letter to him, the BBC would cancel it on a personal whim, regardless of how the story ended. Sayward was incredibly irritated that Nathan Turner favoured what was, in his view, a less dramatic and clichéd ending, and one that certainly didn't respect the legacy of one of Classic Who's most acclaimed writers. And so, to cut a long story short, with thanks to my local circumcision specialist, Dr. Wenner, the two had a big bust-up, culminating with fists and guns and swearing and Sayward withdrawing permission for his treatment of episode 14 to be used. Nathan Turner then had to get Pip and Jane Baker to write a new episode 14 in just five days, with the sets already built and the writers legally unable to be told anything about what was originally going to happen. This means that episodes 13 and 14 are very different. The variation in writers inevitably results in a jarring tonal shift, and episode 13 sets up a tone and mood that's very reminiscent of previous Robert Holmes stories, with its darkly lit Victorian streets and Matrix shenanigans, only for all of this to be brushed under. 
This is not the fault of Pip and Jane Baker by any means. They joined the dots in the only way they could in such a short time frame, and they certainly provide some moments of invention, such as the Doctor being found guilty only for it to be another Matrix illusion. Mind you, though, the revelation that the Vanyard is going to use a megabyte modem to achieve world domination is a bit... you know, insert adjective of your choice here. I put off watching episode 14 for ages because I was aware of its production problems and feared the worst. But you know, having seen episode 14 for the first time recently, there's only one major problem with it. I have to conclude that Eric Saywood was right. The Dane Newmont, often uncharitably described as a panto walkdown, is at complete odds with the rest of the season. It's it's just too neat and dull, and it's somewhat abrupt following the dramatic happenings of the previous 13 episodes. Surely the Doctor should have been vindicated back in episode 13, when it was revealed that the trial had fallen apart because the same person was spoiler, prosecutor and defendant, which instantly could have been a great twist, but it ultimately doesn't lead to anything, so what's the point? There could have been a balance, the Doctor could have been pardoned, making his subsequently being trapped in the Matrix more dramatic, which would have provided suitable closure. The Trial, it was corrupt all along, so what does it matter if a judgement isn't reached? God, it's bloody stupid, it's a farce! A Farago of trumped up... What the hell is a Farago anyway? I'd, um, I'd love to talk more about it, but... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm feeling rather faint. What the hell is that bright light?! beginning to fear that you had lost yourself. Sit down. Would it be too much to ask what all this is about? The accused will remain silent until invited to speak. The accused? You mean me? I inquire upon the Valiard to open the case. By order of the YouTube community guidelines. This is an impartial inquiry into the behaviour of the accused person, known as Max, who is charged that he, on divers occasions, has been guilty of conduct unbecoming a YouTuber. NOT GUILTY! He is also charged with, on divers occasions, transgressing the first law. It is my unpleasant task, Madam Inquisitor, to prove to the inquiry that Max is a prat, a whiny baby, who has temper tantrums because the show known as Doctor Who isn't the show that he wants it to be. And he thinks he owns the show, when in fact, he does not. Yes, I see, Vanyard, that you couldn't even be bothered to come up with any original gags for this part of the video, instead resorting to copying the entire introduction to the trial of the Time Lord, word for word, in an obvious rip-off that will probably try to justify with some smart-ass comments or something or other. He couldn't even be asked to do a decent impression of me. That is so, my lady, and I would contend that he is equally incompetent at doing an impersonation of my sweet and sour classically trained dialect. For that reason, halfway through the trial, I propose that we inexplicably change the charges to genocide. Sorry, did I say trial? I meant to say inquiry, because that is what this is. An impartial inquiry that will see no tampering with the evidence whatsoever. Very well. Max? You are accused of being a rude, impolite troll who rejects constructive criticism and a positive attitude towards Doctor Who in favour of personal attacks, bigotry and haddocks. Do you wish to say anything before the inquiry proceeds? 
pissed off. Oh, for God's sake, why is there carrot juice all over the floor? Carrot juice, carrot juice.